sin. Work into toil, the ground resisting our efforts to cultivate it did. The world is good, but it is also fallen. Creation is subject to futility. The whole creation is now groaning in labor pains. Romans. As fallen creatures in a fallen world, we also mess up. That's true. We pollute. We can act irresponsibly, so on and so forth. That's all true. But it's misleading and it's missing the point. And here's why I cover that. Because I think most Christians can agree on those principles. But we often fail to logically work out our faith. It's like we have fit bodies and fat minds, like Oz said. And because of that, we adopt materialistic, godless assumptions about culture and about our environment. And that's not right. Just because something feels right, you have to think about it. Make sure it is right. Here's a real game changer, right? How, how often do you hear about resources? You pretty much hear about that every election. People think of the stuff that you can weigh. You can count oil in the ground, land underfoot, water in a lake, gold bars in a vault. Some resources, a good quantity of them actually, are renewable. You cut down trees, you plant new ones. You don't have any fear of running out of lumber. In fact, the irony is, despite all this claptrap from the greenies, there's more trees on planet Earth today than there's ever been before. And that's because industry has a vested interest in creating lumber. So this is just nonsense when you hear about this stuff. Other resources are not renewable, however. Oil, coal, for example. So far as we know, and I mean, we might be wrong, oil reservoirs don't refill. On the surface, the warning makes sense, right? We're going to run out of everything. Resources. We're just being pillaged of our resources. The problem with these warnings is that they're regressive, which makes sense because the progressives among us are actually regressives. Regressives in almost every way, but that's another conversation. They make these claims based on known reserves of said resource, say oil, for example. How much oil we know exists today It has nothing, nothing to do with what we'll find tomorrow. And that has been proven over and over again. In fact, the last 10 years, we found an unbelievably big, huge, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of natural resources, coal, oil, natural gas, so on and so forth. They're just wrong because they're regressive, because they don't think about these things correctly. In other words, how much oil we know about doesn't tell us much about how much oil exists. Discovering oil, by the way, costs money. You wouldn't know that from the claptrap that leaves the Democratic Party lips. BP, Exxon Mobil, etc. They have to lay out a lot of dough, a lot of greenbacks, digging a lot of dry oils until they find one. That's a crucial point. That's important to economics. You never hear about that stuff from the class warfare nonsense. Here's something Thomas Sowell said, and I think it's brilliant. How much of any given natural resource is known to exist depends on how much it costs to know. That makes sense, right? This is exploration. These are people risking their own capital to go and find it because there's a profit margin. People don't just do this out of the goodness of their heart. They go because they can make money. That's why capitalism and profit isn't bad. The left don't like it, but it's not bad. And you know why you know it's not bad? Because your house is filled, again, with things that exist because there's a profit margin. And by the way, as current supplies of anything dwindle, demand spikes. Price of barrel goes up. Prices get high enough and encourages oil companies or any other commodity seeker to go after new reservoirs, to go after new product. When they find new oil or new product, in the case of oil, they have to tap it, they have to estimate its size, they have to transport it, they have to refine it, they have to deliver it. New supplies of oil and markets regulate the price, making exploration profitable, making your life better, making energy cheaper. There's so much win here, but the left have alternative motive, trying to expose those with simple economic clarity. Nanny state regulations are a nightmare, a nightmare to you, by the way, and a nightmare to the poor, which is why I'm a capitalist, which is why if you're a Christian, you should be too, and you should care about the poor. That's why you should support free markets, because big government socialism and nanny state self-interest, they pick the winners and losers. This is horrible. Oil is still the best and cheapest source of energy. That's why we use it. Ingenuity will change this. Ingenuity will make it better. Here's a story I love. In the 1980s, economics, in the 1980s, an economist, Julian Simon, made a famous bet with refuted, embarrassed, ridiculous biology and environmentalist doomsdayer Paul Eltrich. Eltrich has been predicting nonsense for years and still gives lectures in universities, by the way, on your dime, despite being wrong every single solitary time. Anyway, Simon publicly bet $1,000 that 
that over the next 10 years, the real price of any five commodities that Ultra wanted to pick would go down, not up. Ultra and his team of environmentalists, wacko sucking off the public dole, picked five commodities. They picked nickel, tin, they picked tungsten, they picked chrome, they picked copper. Eldridge lost the bet. Another loss piling up in the, in the loser column for this nonsense thrower. The real price of all five commodities went down in the 80s. And here's the thing. Simon, an economist, knew something that Eldridge, a nonsense artist, did not know. He knew that we developed new ways of exploration, mining, refining. Future resources are often cheaper than acquiring current resources. In other words, future ways of acquiring oil are cheaper than present ways. And that was true. Think about the 90s. We didn't have fracking. We didn't have all the stuff that we have now. Necessity, mother of invention, that kind of thing. It's common sense when you just think about it. Simon, the economist, knew another indisputable fact, that over time, virtually all natural resources you can think of, oil, copper, mercury, coal, whatever, has gotten less scarce and more plentiful, therefore less expensive. This is easily established, by the way, by looking at price trends and resources historically. Adjusting for inflation over the long run, they always go down. Prices always go down, not up. Stop and think about that for a moment because it probably sounds weird to you. It probably sounds the opposite of true, but it's not. It's a well-established fact. We tend to notice only in short terms. You tend to think only hand in front of your face. You tend to think of only the time you live in and you don't factor in the magical element of human ingenuity. The leftists are always making this falsehood assumption, always making it. It's a materialist myth. It's a zero-sum game type of thing. What they basically do is they think only of the material parts of a resource. And it's kind of silly if you think about it because resources just aren't there in a big pool or there in a big tank in the ground. We create resources. We create commodities. Gas, for example, which always rolls off the leftist lunatic lips, is something we created, by the way. Again, thinking is the greatest leftist kryptonite. Just think about things. For centuries, oil was viewed as mainly it was like this irritant pollutant. It was a glob. When people did find this bubbling stuff up on the surface, they weren't pleased about it. In 1840, somebody figured out how to refine, keyword refine, oil into kerosene. That was human ingenuity. That was creation. That was taking the elements of the earth and creating it. Sounds like the biblical model, right? The one we read about from God's word. Someone else then figured out how to turn kerosene into a useful commodity in illuminating lamps. Whales were, by the way, pretty pleased because before that we were using whale oil in lamps. Saving the environment, by the way, with oil. Suddenly, there was demand for petroleum. And in 1985, the first oil well was dug 69 feet down in the ground. A guy named Edwin Drake, by the way, in western Pennsylvania, my own William Penn's Pennsylvania. I was raised in Pennsylvania. It rendered 15 barrels of that black stuff a day, now called black gold. It took off. That stuff took off with the invention of cars and the combustion engine. By the way, if leftists would have lived then, they would have been like, no, no, no combustion engine. No combustion engine. We need horse and buggy, horse plop turds all over the road. That's the future because we're progressive. Since then, we've learned how to explore, refine it, use it more effectively. It went from gurgling up and making a mess in some poor farmer's cornfield to changing the world. And what was the, what was the factor, I ask you? The ingenuity of man that the big government always gets in the way of. That's the key point. That's what you need to drive home and that's what you need to tell your friends. Most resources are only resources because human beings are involved in some way. The, the matter in a, a material resource matters a whole lot less than the human being creatively transforming it. It's the creative human being that's the real money maker. The elements in that thing are just sitting there until somebody does something with it. And that's working fine until some leftist comes along and tries to tax it or halt it or regressively stop it. Well, they want the benefits, of course. But everybody else needs to. Al Gore wants to stop it because he wants carbon credits. Those are the feelings. And we're talking about oil because that's the obsession with the left. But it's not just oil. Wood is transferred into fuel, into lumber, straw, into baskets, clay, into pots, bricks, into 
buildings, fur into coats, fields into farms, iron into walls and spears, cotton into clothing, copper into phone lines, sand into computer chips, and fiber optic cables, light into lasers. It's unbelievable when you think about it. It's ingenuity. It's free markets. It's capitalism. It's shared goods. It's shared commodities. It's serving your fellow man with your God-given abilities. And I'm so sick and tired of the regressive left stopping it. And by the way, capitalists and conservatives and, and people who love prosperity and love imagination, we don't just figure out how to use resources more effectively. We discover how to create and fundamentally discover completely different types of resources. And at every stage, you got some doomsday leftists to scribbling down some math. The current level of resources will be depleted, therefore you must give me the power of the... Roll up your sleeves and create something. Do something. Don't just lust after power, gain power, and then puppeteer all the other people that are actually contributing, actually making life better. No, we must control and allocate and dictate, and we must be in charge of divvying things up. It makes me sick. It's the antithesis of everything that I'm about. And they've always been like this. Back in in, uh, the 1600s, England was, oh, there's lumber shortages. It got so severe in the 1700s that people feared the complete loss of wood. And what happened? Wood became too costly to fuel homes and fuel businesses and encourage innovation. And they found another resource, coal. Forests are back up and running. See, it wasn't complaining or doomsdaying. It was ingenuity, problem solving. This is hardly inevitable. It takes effort. It takes ingenuity. It takes willpower. It takes the role of prices, it takes scarcity, creative conspiring. And here's the thing that drives me nuts. Everybody talks about alternative energies. I love alternative energies. And we would have likely been here right now. We would have likely found the alternative. But the big, fat, bloated, bureaucratic, fail government keeps getting in the way, keeps wasting money on Solyndra and the like, instead of letting markets and ingenuity solve our problems. Solve our problems. Government doesn't solve our problems. People solve our problems. Big government makes small, tiny, non-creative, non-productive people. And you need to know that. Economists everywhere have been doomsday predicting that coal's going to run out, that petroleum's going to run out, that oil's going to put out, predicting, you know, nail-biting oil strain dust predictions and, and in fact, energy's just gotten cheaper, cheaper and cheaper over time. It's a fact. Think about it. Think about it. And by the way, it's become less scarce and far less costly. You can go into a building, uh, a coffee shop, uh, an airport, you get free electricity for your laptops, for your phone, random outlets all over the country. This would be unthinkable in times of, say, Edison. Think about that. They've been predicting this stuff, and they're always wrong. And and we just keep swallowing it up and granting these clowns power. The founder of OPAC, who I'm not a big fan of, said something that I think is kind of cool. He said, the Stone Age came to an end not for a lack of stones. And the Oil Age will come to an end not for a lack of oil, but because of innovation. Because of innovation. Because of people. Because of creativity. Not, not, not because of government regulations. And I swear, you know, these guys, they really do think that all commodities, money, anything cool, basically think of everything good. And the left thinks it's all in this fixed pot called energy. Oh, my gosh. We do not love nature. 20% of the population uses 80% of the world's energy. There's not enough energy to go around. And there's not enough for all the peoples to live like we live. And the planet is just running out of everything. And we're awful. We need to stop having plumbing in every house. And it's just, it's awful, I say. I'm about to play for you a UN bureaucrat lunatic, environmentalist, whack job, lunatic, regressive, horse and buggy, dark ages, psychopath, which, by the way, Barack Obama's administration is crawling in bed with and sacrificing your free natural rights at the altar of these lunatics. Listen to this person. Clear fact the projections have us. Uh growing in our population uh, capacity. We're already pushing on the boundaries of uh, the planet 
both with food and water uh, and energy, just because of the carbon intensive technologies that we've been using for 100 years. Uh, it really is a, a big question. What are we going to do? Not only do we have that situation, but we have that situation in the context of global climate change. Even without climate change, even without the forcing of climate, it would still be a challenge. But with climate change, that challenge is amplified, it is magnified.